Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Fitness Solutions Strength and Resistance Training for Arthritis Facebook Live event. My name is Ashley Nicole, and I am the founder and master trainer coach with RA Warrior Fitness. I am a 17-year rheumatoid arthritis patient. Um, I've lived with RA, like I said, for the last 17 years, and I've actually turned that around into a positive where I actually started my own business, RA Warrior Fitness, where my mission is to empower women living with rheumatoid arthritis to improve their quality of life through faith, food, and fitness. And so I'm so excited to be here today to moderate this discussion as um, resistance and, and weight training is one of my favorites. And I also want to, um, to mention that I am the adult honoree for the Jingle Bell Run for the Arthritis Foundation in North Texas this year. So shameless plug, if you have not registered for that Jingle Bell Run, <laughs> Now's the time to do so. So I'm having so much fun fundraising and building the RA Warrior Fitness Squad team. So I just wanted to thank the Arthritis Foundation for uh, the opportunity to be honored and just to be able to spread awareness because this is something that is near and dear to my heart. So um, the reason why we're here, of course, is to talk about strength and resistance training. So physical activity is one of the best non-drug ways for managing pain and stress. A balanced fitness routine is one that incorporates strength training, balance and flexibility and cardiovascular activity. However, tonight we'll be focusing specifically on strength and management. I'm sorry, strength and resistance training, which is key for supporting and protecting joints. You can view our past events on cardio and balance and flexibility by visiting arthritis.org forward slash webinars. So now I'd love to introduce our guests. Our exceptional panel of, um, of fitness and joint protection experts will teach us how to safely incorporate strength and resistance training into a well-balanced workout plan for arthritis. So let's start with Lauren Schroyer. Lauren Troyer currently serves as the Vice President of Product and Innovation at the American Council on Exercise, also known as ACE. With an educational background in sports medicine, she started her career working with injured athletes before moving into the fitness industry. As a personal trainer and then educator, Lauren's passion has been to help people with stubborn chronic pain and orthopedic conditions return to an active lifestyle. Give everybody a wave, Lauren. <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Ashley. You're welcome. Now I'd like to introduce Jessica Hetler. Jessica Hetler is a doctor of physical therapy and director at the Hospital of Special Surgery Rehabilitation and Performance Department. She's also a certified athletic trainer, board certified in sports and orthopedics through the American Physical Therapy Association and McKinsey Certified Therapist, which focuses on the assessment and management of spinal and other extremity musculoskeletal disorders. She completed her clinical competency in aquatic therapy and her areas of clinical interest are shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, and lumbar spine. Say hello, Jessica. Welcome. <laughs> All right, last and certainly not least, Ms. April O'Connell is a certified hand therapist uh, and a graduate of Boston University. For 14 years, she served on New York University's faculty as a clinical specialist, where she has heavily involved in research, mentorship, and the creation of NYU Health's American Occupational Therapy Association Hand Therapy Fellowship. She works with the NFL and MLB and is a founding member of the 3D golf and pitch smart labs and specialized in athletic performance and injury prevention. Recently, she has joined the Southern California Orthopedic Institute, where she is excited to continue the Institute's excellence in rehabilitative medicine. Welcome, April. Thank you, Ashley. You're welcome. So thank you all so much for joining tonight. So let's get into it. Let's get started. Our first topic tonight is about getting started with the strength and resistance training routine for arthritis. But before we dive in, let's first defi define strength and resistance training and the role it plays in helping to manage arthritis. Lauren, would you like to kick us off with that as we define those two? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ashley. So uh, resistance training is, uh, is 
I think sometimes misunderstood. People think of resistance training as big dumbbells and doing squats and throwing things around in the gym. Um, but a resistance training really is um, training to strengthen muscles. Mm -hmm. And that can be done even with your own body weight sometimes, mm -hmm. because sometimes strengthening is just your own body weight and you'll get stronger from doing that. So um, especially when it is uh, for somebody who has arthritis or chronic pain, the uh, the medium that you use for resistance training becomes important. So you start to think a little bit more about um, implements like medicine balls or resistance bands or even dumbbells like dumbbells or body weight training mm -hmm. so that you can control a little bit more the direction of the exercise itself. Uh, when you're locked into a machine, sometimes the direction that the machine takes your body is not a direction that your joints want to go. Uh, so that can be rather uncomfortable. But when you use resistance bands or you're using um, dumbbells or medicine balls, then you can strengthen your muscles in the directions that is most comfortable for your body and for your joints. Mm -hmm. um, and the importance of that is, is really endless. As um, our bodies are in pain, uh, we to actually tend to get weaker. Uh, we go into an inflammation cycle that will cause weakness in the muscles. When mm -hmm. the muscles weaken, then the joints um, start to sometimes collapse in on themselves, take different positions, mm -hmm. um, can decrease in space, and all of that can put pressure on the joint itself. So in the case of osteoarthritis, put more compression in there. Um, and in the case of um, RA, you know, you already have all the swelling in there, and now you're putting more pressure into the swelling. So the strength Opening itself actually mm -hmm. can create a little bit more space in the joints so you can move more fluidly um, mm -hmm. and more efficiently in your activities of daily living. So uh, resistance exercise is extremely important for people who are struggling with arthritis. Yes, I absolutely agree. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Jessica or April? I think that was an awesome explanation. I would actually like to add to something to that. I think that's a really uh, you made excellent points. And I think mm -hmm. when you look at the research and you scrutinize it, you see that um, we, we compare exercise to all forms of, of medicines, right? Um, the cortisone injections, Tylenol, NSAIDs, things to make feel, people feel better. And we can see from these high levels of evidence that um, exercise wins out with, with all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so with traditional treatments like cortisone injections, um, there is actually better long-term results with using exercise rather than cortisone injections um, in the medium and long-term um, with long-term results. And when you compare ibuprofen and Tylenol, exercise therapy seems to be at least as effective as using NSAIDs and two to three mm -hmm. times more effective than using acetaminophen um, in reducing knee arthritis um, in, mm -hmm. in the systematic review that was published in, um, a few years ago. Uh, and even if you look at arthrop arthroscopic surgery, that's not even surviving the scrutiny of placebo effects. Um, arthritis or exercise always seems to win out when you look at um, dealing with painful arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great. So you want to just be careful of, in terms of prescribing it, not to overload the tissue, especially with RA. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to be very thoughtful in how you dose your earth, um, exercise, just like you would dose, use medicine for anything. You want, don't want to overdose, you want to, don't want to underdose. You have to find the Goldilocks of dosing for exercise for it to be the most effective. Absolutely. I love that. And so it kind of goes back to that um, quote, movement is medicine. And I really feel that that's true. You know, movement is some of the best medicine um, because it's just, it's just good for the body. Awesome. All right. So what are the best types of physical activity to promote strength and resistance training for someone with arthritis? Um, so I'll kick that off to, to anyone who wants to answer. The best types of physical activity to promote strength and resistance training for someone with arthritis. So whether that's free weights, lifting versus resistance bands versus body weight. So I think it's really dependent on the person and where they're starting from. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really something to consider. Uh, you know, people um, who have arthritis have different levels of activity in their lives right now. Um, some are um, just starting to experience pain after you know years and years of a of a very active lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. Some have been kept maybe away from an active lifestyle because of the pain that they've experienced for a long por portion of their life. Mm -hmm. um, and 
uh, where you begin is, is, it's really important to remember where you begin is just where you are and, and that's just okay. Mm -hmm. um, and in the first step is finding something that um, feels good in the moment and doesn't hurt more the next day. And, um, and sometimes it's a little trial and error uh, for people to find that right thing. Um, it's one of, as you said earlier, one of my passions is helping people find that trial through trial and error is, okay, what is the right thing that makes you feel good right now? It's not painful while you're doing it. And tomorrow, it's still not painful. And we haven't increased the pain. We haven't made things worse. Because the reality is um, a lot of people with arthritis are struggling with pain every day. So um, what we're looking at is what is your normal baseline of pain and how does that change? And are, is that normal baseline staying the same? Okay. Um, then what we're doing is okay because mm -hmm. if it's staying the same, we're still successful and we're working our way towards progression. And um, if that pain is getting better, excellent. But if that pain is getting worse, we've gone the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, we picked the wrong exercise for the day. And, and so listening to your body becomes really important in understanding you know, what is the, the right thing to investigate. Um, I always start with body weight training. Um, and as I said earlier, I always start with either you know, free weights, dumbbells, um, mm -hmm. med balls, or resistance bands because um, we can move within um, that body's zone of freedom. Right? Somebody mm -hmm. who has shoulder arthritis has a limited range of motion. motion um, yeah. And we want to be respectful of that limited range of motion and we want to move within that limited range of motion uh, in a pain-free way. Uh, so mm -hmm. those are some of the implements that I usually recommend. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said as far as meeting the, you know, the, the patient where they are, the client where they are. Um, and that's one thing that I tell my clients all the time is to, you know, not focus on what you can't do in this moment, you know, focus on what you can do and do more of that, but still yeah. listen to your body, you that's know, right. so that's so true. Absolutely. And I think to add to what both of you said, which I think was said really wonderfully, um, is understanding if where the baseline of where the patient is today, right? Mm -hmm. it's, there's no one size fits all model for some of right. arthritis. As we've stated, there are different types of arthritis, different joints that are affected. Mm -hmm. So I also think remembering, you know, if doing things on land, I would say in your everyday is too much, getting into a pool, which will help unload your joints and allow you mm -hmm. to move more freely while providing resistance, and then you can add different tools into the water to give you more resistance. Sometimes it's a great way to kickstart you into exercise because you don't become discouraged from it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, I think April, you said it is not underdosing or overdosing is kind of figuring out what is your right amount of time to build up understanding what your goals are. And then I think to Lauren's point is you have to respect how much you can do to start and then understanding your rest and recovery in order mm -hmm. to do it. And along with that is understanding the difference between pain and muscle soreness versus mm -hmm. joint pain. So right. if you're sore in your muscles, that's a good thing. But like Lauren said, you shouldn't have this soreness lasting days afterwards. Mm -hmm. It should be a delayed onset of soreness, but right. it resolves on its own easily. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great points. Great I would points. like to touch on that too. Um, sure. In terms of uh, tissue, so in therapy, we treat that arthritic, those arthritic joints, a little bit differently than somebody who doesn't have any arthritis when we're when we're working with them. We know that recovering tissue has a range of loading that is optimal. So you want to, um, your daily activities to neither overload or underload the tissue. So mm -hmm. if you, as um, the person with arthritis, has you have work activities or activities of daily living that place a high demand on that tissue or those joints, then you have to adjust your exercise to keep the overall loading within that optimal loading range. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's really important for people to understand when they're going to take on an exercise program or if they want to increase their exercise program. So oftentimes I tell my patients, um, you have a certain number of activity dollars to use each day to spend on your work, your leisure, your activities of daily living. And then if one of those areas increase, let's say you have to go paint a bathroom or you're cooking a Thanksgiving dinner, other areas will then have to decrease so you don't increase that tissue irritability. So it's like activity dollars for, this, for the day, right? Mm -hmm. So some patients have low 
tissue irritability, so meaning you could um, you could do a whole lot and it won't inflame their joints. Um, and they can tolerate a wide variety of activity challenges without increasing their symptoms. So when you're prescribing exercise or telling people to, to work out and do certain things for this population, it's a lot easier um, than the patients or people with high tissue irritability. Um, and then with them, they, they're more unpredictable of how they're going to respond to um, different types of exercise. So you can really um, send yourself, or if you're training somebody, send that person into an inflammatory state by over prescribing mm -hmm. exercise, or if they do their exercises and then they go home, pay in a bathroom, cook a meal and do all these other things. And they wonder why they're sore. They just did, they did, they spent too much of their activity dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're now they're, they have to loan somebody something. Um, so I think if you can find that balance and then add in the exercise and then ramp up, as that patient's um, tissue irritability stays low, then that's the right amount of exercise. And again, the Goldilocks of dosing, exercise dosing. And it's it's really a delicate dance and everyone is different. And you mm -hmm. have the same person come in and one day they're doing great and you're increasing how much exercise they're doing. And typically we say about the 10% rule. So every week you can increase something by about 10% of their volume. Um, but some weeks they may just have a flare up for some reason. And then you have mm -hmm. to set everything back yes. um, just a little bit. So it's like a little dance. I tell people not to get discouraged. Um, and there's lots of other things they can do. If um, ex the exercises they were doing become too painful, you can regress it. And there's a lot of tips I'm sure we can talk about for regressions. Absolutely. Great points. Great points. So what are the top joint issues to address before getting started with the strength and resistance routine? Mm. I, I'll go back to the, it depends. It depends will be my favorite answer, uh -huh. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay, but you're right. I mean, there's no one size fit all. It doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and I think that's, uh, it, it's important to start to learn your body. And I think that's um, sort of what we're all saying here is it's important to start to learn your body. And um, one thing that, you, so I've done as a professional is, you know, I take notes. So when I'm seeing, I'm working with somebody on a regular basis, I'm taking notes, what's causing things to flare up, what's painful, what feels good. Um, and and when you're working on your own, you should be taking those own notes and, and hey, this felt good. I like this exercise. It feels good when I do this. Um, you know, this maybe was a little bit too much, or maybe I shouldn't go paint the bathroom after I work out. Um, you know, that was that was just overdosing for me. Um, but uh, as as people are sort of easing into things, I think, um, and you already talked about them actually in the in the previous uh, webinars that were done, is you know you have stretching um, and balance. We have you know cardiovascular activity, and we have strength training. And it's really important to start to do a little of both, but not, or a little of all three, but not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I think that many people feel very comfortable starting with is starting in with the stretching. And then um, I, I think it's counterintuitive, but probably more important that then they move into the strength training. And the reason mm -hmm. I think it's counterintuitive is that um, we talk so much about cardiovascular activity and cardiovascular activity is essential for many parts of your health. Mm -hmm. um, but it also puts a lot of uh, repetitions on your joints, especially if you have lower body um, arthritis, so mm -hmm. hips, knees, ankles. Uh, so even going for a walk, if you're not strong, each one of those steps is putting a lot of impact through your body. So right. it could be very valuable to start with a strength training program and develop some strength through some body weight squats um, within your comfortable range of motion, potentially using a chair, mm -hmm. um, just to begin to build strength first and then um, and then begin to progress up so that your the volume oh. of activity that you're doing excuse my dog in the background, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. um, uh, the volume of activity you're doing can be moderated a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Perfect. So I think along with what Lauren's saying is like, you know, like he, the example of the squat, which is like the most fantastic exercise. And it's like, how many times do you do a squat a day? How many times do you get up from sitting in a chair mm -hmm. uh, and moving around? So, but it's also making sure that you're moving in the proper way and not moving improperly because improper right. movements are going to cause increasing improper loads to joints and therefore 
pain, which could discourage you from doing them. But knowledge is powerful for people mm -hmm. to understand the how to. And yes. I think April said it before is, you know, making those modifications. Like, I don't expect someone to go down into a, a pistol squat the first time they did it that's a bit excessive right but maybe it's a, Can you do a demonstration for us for a pistol squat um, i probably would fall over right about now. <laughs> you know i've never been able to do a pistol squat it's still annoying yeah me but neither it's... it's okay i'm gonna be 40 so i'm gonna just let it go so um but you know things like that it's like you know working up to it like you might have a, a couch and you might add two cushions to the top because you can do like a 45 degree squat comfortably. Mm -hmm. And then as you gain your good range of motions and some flexibility and it's available to you, you can take one cushion off and that's a goal achieved until you wow. get down to like sitting in a chair where you're at 90 degrees box corner at the hip and the knee. And that's a perfect place to be. You don't have to drop lower than that. You can add external weight to that. To make mm -hmm. it fun, you can take like a gallon of water if you want. You can, if you have, you know, a grandchild, you can take a package of diapers. Like there's so many things in your home. You right. don't have to go out and buy these really expensive new toys. You can do a lot with things you just have in your house. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us got creative with that too once the pandemic hit, because I remember... <laughs> recording videos and doing this uh, exercise with a case of water. I had a 24 case of water and I was literally doing rows with it and like picking it up and I was using toilet paper and doing Russian twists. So, I mean, literally you can get creative with things that you have at home. There are that no precious excuses. toilet paper. I hope yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when I was doing that, they were like, so you're the one that took all the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> One of my coworkers did a session and she had all household items and she had like half a container of like cat litter that she used as a weight to kind of lift and put down and stuff. And I was like, I never even thought about something like that. That's just yeah. getting inventive. Exactly. I used my one-year-old as like to front load my <laughs> myself. And then I used my five-year-old to get on my back to do squats. Ah, I love because that. That's my great. <laughs> it's a family routine. Everybody right. involved. It also teaches them the importance of exercise and how you have to treat your body really well, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so instilling Aren't that into your children at a young age, I think is so important. It is. Um, I think in terms of exercising, you know, finding the right type of exercise is really important and making modifications as you see fit. And especially when it comes to arthritis of the hands and the wrists and the shoulders, mm -hmm. um, we also don't want to forget our neck. So any weight bearing joints, um, people I'm sure listening can know all too well, you know, your cervical spine or your neck, um, your lower back, all of those things. And you, if you're stiff or you're pain, you're your body is always going to go to the path of least resistance. So let's say if you're weak somewhere and you go to do something, you may, and you're very weak in your core, you may want to um, squat or, or sit down or lift things using so much of your lower back. So mm -hmm. you, understanding proper technique and maintaining and gaining strength through your, your core, your trunk is going to be so important for your limbs and extremities to move off of a stable base. Um, sometimes I tell my clients, make sure that they're um, checking in their chin so they're stacking their spine one on top of another as they're lifting and lowering. Um, and sometimes it's helpful if they have shoulder arthritis to do an exercise with their back against the wall. So it mm -hmm. creates some stability for their shoulders, shoulder blades to move on. Um, mm -hmm. It also cues them to pull their chin in and um, align their spine so they're not leading with their neck. And you'll see a lot of people when they're lifting weights, they look like this, right? Mm -hmm. That's because they don't they lack good stability in their core, their pillar. So I tell people to pull their chin up, um, create, help with breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing can be helpful when doing exercise. So you're um, maintaining the most of movement efficiency as possible. And mm -hmm. if they're still having problems, I tell them to place their tongue to the roof of their mouth to help create added stability um, mm -hmm. as they're lifting. Um, because if they are weak in their core, they may need to find stability from somewhere. So rather than it being in their low back um, or their neck jutting out into forward flexion, they can pull everything up, get it nice and tight, and then use 
and they still lack strength, we use that tongue into the roof of their mouth to help them. Um, so that's a little cue that I'll give to my patients or having their back against the wall to give them some support and also proprioceptive cueing. So when they feel the back against the wall, they'll say, okay, this is how my body should be. Um, and then over time, they can step away from the wall where they may not need that support anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of just blindly giving patients a number of sets and repetitions um, and days per week to do something, um, the prescribing therapist or the personal trainer um, or the patient or the exercise person who's with the patient or the, with the person should really want to think about what they're trying to achieve, right? And um, what stage the arthritis, is it, um, is it in a flared up position? Is it, is it in remission? Um, mm -hmm. And what is their activity tolerance? So um, that, will, that will be helpful. So ACSM or the American Council of Sports Medicine um, recommends that two sessions per week of about 30 to 60 minutes in duration of exercise with a potential of one to two further sessions during the week of the patient doing it unsupervised at home is optimal um, for people with arthritis. So that was a, a study that was, um, that was put out in this big systematic review. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, that's a great start for people who are less experienced in exercising. Um, so at least you start with two sessions with maybe somewhere where it's guided, and then you try to do it on your own without it being guided. Um, and that could be helpful. Um, and again, ACSM recommends between two to four sets of eight to 12 reps. And the intensity should be between 60 and 80% of that person's one rep max. So if someone can lift 50 pound dumbbells, um, or let's make it easy for my math, 10 pound dumbbells, then they, <laughs> that, that, that's like 100% of their effort, then they should maybe start out at like between a five and a six pound dumbbell, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then go from there. Um, so the last few repetitions should be a challenge. And I tell people it shouldn't be owl pain. It should be wah pain. Like they like they're crying, like they're they're, they're complaining, like oh this is terrible. I want to stop this. <laughs> Not because their their joints are hurting, but because they, it stinks. They just want to stop because they they feel that burn. It's mm -hmm. they're struggling. They're sweating. They're shaking. Their face is turning red. So all of those things are fine, but not any owl pain. So that's typically where I start with, with um, my arthritis population in terms of getting them started on an exercise mm -hmm. routine. Yeah. And I know I'm going on and on, but um, and please stop me if you want me to. <laughs> no, it's good information. Go ahead. <laughs> I think the last thing that really is the most important is getting the client or the person to have buy-in. Um, mm -hmm. It is so important for this population to stick with it and be compliant, um, to see long-term results of, mm -hmm. of physical exercise on their joints because it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Exercise really helps support those muscles to be strong, help to support maybe an unstable joint or um, a painful joint, and it can really help with pain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, I I'm think done. a lot of our patients will be like, well, how do Great. I cure this arthritis? And we can't cure this arthritis, but we can yeah. make it tolerable. We can make it livable. We can give you back some quality of life. Absolutely. And I always tell my patients, I'm don't get pressed on reps and sets, especially when we start out. I want quality, not mm -hmm. quantity. Right. Love that. Love that. Well, Jessica, I have a question for you. So how can a physical therapist help someone new to strength and resistance training? I think um, as a physical therapist, it's kind of looking at how do these people function in their day and what is limited in their daily acts of living and kind of completing an assessment, understanding the global picture of how this person moves mm -hmm. and where are they lacking. I think we've all hit upon, you know, I know this is more about strength, but where are they strong? Where are they weak? Where are they tight? Where are they loose? And, you know, what is their balance? So I know things from other webinars kind of all tie into how we move and what we do. And understanding that picture for the patient can help lay the foundation, right? I think of physical therapy kind of like as a foundational piece. We get them back to their ADLs. And it's like, I tell my patients, physical therapy is a way to get back to what you like doing. Physical therapy should not be what you love doing. Right. Right. You should love to exercise. And then I transition you on to work with one of our exercise physiologists or a personal trainer in mm -hmm. your community that can help you continue these good patterns. 
Mm -hmm. So I've done my job. If I can decrease your pain, improve your mobility, improve your strength, and therefore improve your everyday function. Right. So what should someone look for in a physical therapist or personal trainer to help them with strength routine for arthritis? What qualities should people look for? I think that's a very personal question to each patient or client. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest things is, as April said, you have to have buy-in. If mm -hmm. you don't believe what you're hearing from the practitioner, then you're not going to be sold on doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do your homework, kind of look people up, ask your family and friends and physicians for recommendations, because oftentimes they may know someone who had a problem. They refer to a patient who was had successful results and therefore you try it. If your personalities mm -hmm. don't match, the nice thing is like you may have done a really great assessment to set them up, but together you don't work. But mm -hmm. there's a colleague in your office that you know like really enjoys the same things, have sa similar temperaments and personalities that you may refer them off to so that they can be successful. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, let's move on to modifications and safety, shall we? So um, what are some tips to safely get started with strength and resistance routine? I feel like we've somewhat answered this, but I don't know if um, you know anyone wants to jump in to maybe offer some additional tips to safely get started for someone who's just brand new to this thing. Yeah, let's just say they're brand new and and they want to start strength and resistance training like what what would you offer them and i think i already know what you're going to say like it depends upon <laughs> the patient right <laughs> i feel like it truly does but you know absolutely yeah, yeah i think um you know it, it getting started i think is the hardest part um mm -hmm. it's the hardest part for anyone uh, to get started into an exercise routine um, our bodies are actually made to conserve energy, right? Uh, so just mm -hmm. you know, through time, our bodies are made to conserve energy um, as a, a safety mechanism in case we go through a famine. And uh, so getting started exercising is hard for mm -hmm. anyone. When you're in pain, it's even harder. It's even harder, started, yeah. Right? Um, so uh, I really think that, um, you know, the, the first thing is, is just knowing that anything is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And a couple of squats, as um, you know, Jessica and I were both talking about squats and using a chair, and just sitting down and standing back up, and sitting down and standing back up, and you're exercising. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's safe. You're in your home. You're in an environment that's comfortable for you. It feels emotionally comfortable for you. Um, and I think that emotional safety is, is a big part of it when you're starting an exercise program for the very first time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica talked a little bit about this and finding the right therapist, physical therapist, somebody who you connect with um, on a personal level. Uh, the same goes for finding the right personal trainer. Of course, you want somebody who has um, a background uh, who has the education, who has the information, who's certified. Um, and But from there, you want to make sure that you feel emotionally comfortable with that person. You feel emotionally safe with that person. Um, and, and then that you're in a setting where there is, um, if you do decide to go to a gym, that there's a variety of equipment available to you so mm -hmm. that you can modify your exercises appropriately. Um, you want to go to a place that um, has multiple different kinds of implements and isn't limited. Mm -hmm. um, and or see a professional who has some creativity and can get out the kitty litter and you know <laughs> think about the that uh, the water bottles that might be bottles, yeah. helpful, right? So, um, so I think that's part of it, and I think uh, you know um, it's just very important just to to recognize uh, your own uh, that you your own fear or concern about yourself and your well-being is a part of this journey. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you should recognize that and honor that as a part of selecting the right exercise program for you as well. Um, you, you know, go outside the comfort zone, mm -hmm. um, make sure you're pushing yourself, but do it in a way um, that honors your own um, anxiety about increasing your pain or potentially increasing your pain. 
uh, in your search for having uh, a, a fuller life, a life full of more activity. Absolutely. So we have a question from our audience um, and it says personal trainers are not always financially feasible. Where do you find an arthritis program that is cost effective? That's a good question. Um, I think this, this is a little bit out of the box, but one thing that people with arthritis can always do um, is if they are, you know, they're having their arthritis, they can always speak with their, um, their family doctor mm -hmm. um, about possibly getting um, a PT or an OT referral, depending on where their arthritis is. So you would have an OT referral if they had um, any arthritis to their hands, elbows, shoulders, PT referral for everywhere else in the body. Um, and you could start there. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have insurance benefits where um, somebody could, you could go in and somebody could help you get you started with exercise mm -hmm. because we're trained to do that. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable going into a hospital or clinic setting, there's always telehealth um, options now with the pandemic. Um, if your insurance, you could always call your insurance and see if you have those benefits. Um, so you don't even have to go into a clinic. You can um, have the evaluation um, over the phone um, through like a, um, like through the portal, through uh, the, uh, through the, the physical therapy or whatnot. Um, and mm -hmm. I did that a lot actually during and, and still through the, after the pandemic or as we're going through the pandemic um, for people who still don't feel comfortable. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice option um, for people just to get them started where they feel like, okay, they can have one or two sessions with the PT or the OT and then they can come back and check in as they're going through their progressions um, and we can be of assistance. That's just rather than getting a personal trainer, that's just one way to get started and then they can go off to the gym um, and use mm -hmm. those techniques um, as they as they see fit. And I can get into modifications in a little bit. But using a web, um, the Arthritis Foundation is a is some place where I always tell my patients to go because the tips mm -hmm. and tricks for arthritis is so fantastic. Um, yeah. And it's one of my, on my evaluation with these patients, it's one of the first places I take them to. It's like, this is, this is a great resource for you to go and, and look at the, look at diet, nutrition, look mm -hmm. at joint protection techniques, make sure you're getting plenty of sleep. Here are all the, um, the little tchotchkes you can get to modify your activities. Um, mm -hmm. So those are all, that's, this is another great resource just to look at and have tips and tricks for for everyday things, you know, how to get in and out of the car and for travel and for gardening and for exercise. So it's, it's a great mm -hmm. you know, resource. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and get into modifications. So let's talk about modifications for free weights, um, free weights lifting, like for the wrist, shoulders, back, um, knees, hips, and ankles. So April, do you want to get us started on that? Sure. Um, so people have, um, so I have no, um, no one pays me for anything. So when I talk about di different things, they're just my personal things that I like. Um, I have okay. nothing to disclose. <laughs> um, <laughs> so some things that I tell my patients to do is when you're gripping weights, oftentimes people will um, hold their stress either in their neck or their hands and over grip things. Um, mm -hmm. And when you over grip things, especially if it's weights or bands or cables, you can irritate your arthritis in your hands. Um, or your wrists. So I always tell people to really relax your grip on, on your weights, on your free weights. And if that's really still too hard for you, um, either you can get gloves to be to pad your hands and also provide neutral warmth and compression to your joints, mm -hmm. um, or even edema gloves. You can find them online. Three, I like the ones that are three quarter length, so the, you, mm -hmm. your fingertips are still out. Mm -hmm. So you don't lose the feeling to your fingertips, but it provides neutral compression. Um, and warmth to your hands. Um, and sometimes I'll use those, you know, if, if they're working out or oftentimes if you're sleeping at night to just kind of relax everything and let everything uh, kind of settle down because our bodies do swell at night and that can create more pain when you, and stiffness when you wake up in the morning. So the edema gloves can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So uh, having patients uh, have a really light grip on their weights and if they have a really bad thumb arthritis, I tell them to hold the weight with the thumb on there's the camera with a thumb on top. So the weight is here and they're not even using their thumb. If you wrap mm -hmm. your thumb around the weight like this, typically you'll over grip the weight. So if you bring mm -hmm. your thumb up and out of it, uh, you'll relax your hand a little bit more. 
Um, there are different types of splints that you can use that are soft neoprene splints. There's a variety on the market. The mm -hmm. ones that I typically like um, are the comfort cool ones um, that you can find online. Um, mm -hmm. they, there's a strap that goes around the thumb and it really helps support the thumb. And I like those a lot for weightlifting. Mm -hmm. um, and also and can I just mention something about that? So I actually have some on now. These are what I like to use. Um, it kind of, you've got the thumb grip here and then the elastic just kind of comes around. And so this is what's really helped me, you know, as far as lifting weights. And I used to use another brand, but I actually just had some branded for Ari Warrior Fitness. So I absolutely love these. So and do you recommend you. something like this? Because I, I have arthritis. Mine is in my wrist yeah. mainly. So I was going to say, Ashley, for you, that's exactly what I would recommend because you yeah. have great wrist support. So it's mm -hmm. going to support your wrist, but it's not going to limit your motion. Right. right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, another thing when you're lifting weights is that you want to make sure that your wrist, speaking of wrists, stay in neutral. So when you're mm -hmm. lifting a weight, you'll see people like lifting dumbbells and their wrists oftentimes look like this and they're lifting dumbbells. So mm -hmm. I tell people, make sure that you activate those good muscles on the inside part of the hand and keep mm -hmm. your wrist in neutral as you're lifting any weight, whether you're, whatever you're doing, whether you're doing a military press, chest mm -hmm. press, whatever it is. Oftentimes people let the bar hang on their wrists and that's awful for your wrists. Yeah. Um, yeah and it looks so painful too. <laughs> well, for you, I'm sure. So yeah, you want to make sure that you keep your wrists pulled so they're straight. So this is considered a neutral wrist mm -hmm. and you don't want to ever lift weights with your wrist hanging. Um, mm -hmm. You want to keep everything really tight. Same with your core. Also lift from whenever you lift your arms or your hands up, Think about pressing down through your feet, letting that energy travel up through the legs, through the glutes, through the buttocks, and then up through the core, and then finally your, to your shoulders and hands. And oftentimes you will see that you can lift a lot easier when you think about that process. Mm -hmm. um, it makes mm -hmm. it heavy lifting a lot easier. So light grip, thumb on the top, neutral wrists when possible, unless you're actually working your forearms. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, making sure that you're not working into pain you can work through a range of motion and stop right before you feel that owl pain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if lifting weights is too difficult, maybe you have to take a regression and start with isometric exercise. So mm -hmm. isometric exercise is a great way to work different joints without stressing the joints. So you, um, so for example, for, for the wrist, you might start with your wrist in neutral. Mm -hmm. the isometric exercise is where the muscle is contracting, but it's not lengthening and it's not shortening. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to pull the wrist up, but your other hand pulls the wrist down at the same time. And so there's equal pressure down, equal pressure up. And typically mm -hmm. in order for um, muscles to change, you want that that maximum amount to be about 70% of your, of your all out effort. But mm -hmm. if you are having an active flare up of arthritis, you might bring that down to 50% or 40% of what you can tolerate. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure that you're breathing so you don't increase your blood pressure uh, because holding your breath during isometric exercise can increase your blood pressure. And, mm -hmm. um, to, and with, uh, what ACSM recommends is holding the, each exercise for six seconds and you can repeat that 10 times. And if it's too hard to do 10, you can do two sets of five or mm -hmm. grade it as you see fit. Um, so that's another modification. If lifting weights going through a full motion is too difficult, maybe start with isometrics or just holding a weight in different planes um, mm -hmm. and then going from there. Got it. Okay, great tips. Love it, love it. So let's talk about modifications for other body-based strength training. So like body weight stuff, push-ups, squats, um, sit-ups, plank, lunges. Uh, what are some common modifications for that? So when it comes to planks, which I think is like one of our most favorite core exercises because it doesn't put a lot of load through our spine, like I personally try to avoid sit-ups with my patients because of the increased lever arm and torque on the body. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not necessary, especially if you have arthritis. Sometimes too much flexion is no good mm -hmm. uh, and you lack the control to come off of it. So planks, I think there's no age or no person that can't do some type of variety of a plank. And I think you have to think of, you know, don't just do these things as you see on the YouTube video, because these people have usually been doing them for a very long time. Oh, wow. Right. Right. So <laughs> knowing that you don't have to go from your toes to your forearms, but you can go from your knees to your forearms and mm -hmm. to do a good plank, start with a short duration of time and work your time increment up. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you're going to do like a side plank, you know, I find we can get really fancy with side planks from going from your knees to your forearm. Um, if you want to just increase your lever, so the longer the lever is, the harder the exercise is. So feet to forearm, you can do that. But even staying on your knees, you can do some other active movements that are really good mm -hmm. for your body. You can open up your top knee like a clamshell with right. or without resistance. You mm -hmm. could straighten the top leg out and lift it up. You could take your arm up to the ceiling and you can rotate it under. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you want to do five of each of those things. And that's how you're going to do your side plank. Mm -hmm. You can also change the surface you're on. So instead of being on a solid surface or an exercise mat, you could put your arms maybe on a physio ball or on a BOSU ball, the half bubble ball, or mm -hmm. simply on a foam pad just to add a change of surface. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes for push-ups, um, you know, I don't think anybody with arthritis is just going down and pushing out 50 push-ups on the floor. I'm not doing that myself. So <laughs> you have to think of where are you? And simply I might start my patients doing a wall push-up. Mm -hmm. to maybe using their countertop for a little bit of an incline for a push-up to then going down on the floor and doing them off from your knees. As we used to know back in the day, the girly push-up. No, that's a modified push-up and it's really good that you can get there Absolutely. before you go out to a longer lever. But right. those are just some of my tips and tricks for those. Yeah, and I like your modification too for the push-ups because for me personally, my arthritis really went untreated for about six years before I actually got diagnosed. So by the time that I got diagnosed, I had severe joint damage in my wrist. So like my wrist, like literally I have no range of motion. So like doing a push up, like anything hands down, just can't do it. But I do, uh, I can do the elevated push up, like on the counter. That's helpful. Um, you know, as long as I have, you know, some support as well, you know, to keep my wrist steady. So, uh, yeah, I love those modifications for sure, because, you know, there are some people like me who may have waited a while before they actually got diagnosed and have, you know, damage and, you know, Literally, there's just no movement there. So, you know, we have to be very careful. And like we've all been saying, just just listen to your body and just, you know, celebrate what you can do with those modifications. Yes. OK, so let's see. What about resistance bands? Let's talk about that. I love resistance bands. Resistance Laura, did you want to talk about that? Sure. I, yeah. Resistance uh -huh. bands are great. I think um, the sometimes I have a little bit of a love hate relationship with them. I absolutely use them. Um, and I do think that they can be great. And I think that, um, they really fill a gap for a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're trying to exercise at home, um, they're a relatively inexpensive option. They're a wonderful way, um, to do upper body exercises with resistance. Um, I might want to the most widely recommended and kind of basic exercises is a seated row where you've got the resistance coming out from in front of you and you're pulling your shoulder blades down and back. It's wonderful mm -hmm. for posture. Um, it's wonderful if you sit all day long as most of us do or binge watching Netflix and slouching on your couch. It's a great exercise for strengthening there. Opens up the chest. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you open up the chest, now you're giving more space um, in the shoulders. So there's an area in the shoulder where um, with getting too technical on anybody uh, that uh, several tendons and nerves will go through this little tiny space. And um, as those are going through this little tiny space, if we are slouched forward, that space gets even smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and that can cause a lot of pain. It can cause radiating pain down the arms and into the wrists and fingers. Um, and if you have arthritis now, you know, you're sort of adding insult to injury. So, um, so that, that posture is really important all of the time. And we've been talking about it a lot while you're exercising, it's essential while you're exercising, but it's really important to have that strength. And mm -hmm. resistance bands can be wonderful for that at home. Uh, the reason I say uh, that I have a love-hate relationship with them is that as um, a resistance band is, is a rubber band and it gets more taut, the more mm -hmm. you pull. So the mm -hmm. end of your range of motion is actually the hardest of the pull. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a row and you're getting to the point where it's hard and you're here, 
you're much more likely to, to go into the wrong position. You're much more yeah. likely to shrug. You're less likely to be able to keep your shoulders down. And you're less likely to get into that nice full squeeze um, through the shoulder blades. Um, but right here, it may feel like you're not doing anything at all <laughs> in the beginning of the pull. So um, one way to get around that is to stand in a position where you're doing a partial range of motion so mm -hmm. that you're at the right resistance for maybe your elbow start bend and you're just doing the end of that range of motion and you're working through that, but really focused mm -hmm. on that squeeze back and down with the shoulder blades. Um, and then you take a couple steps back and now you work on the, the beginning of the range of motion, which might get a little bit more of your forearm and, and through, um, you know, through the biceps. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a workaround. It's an unfortunate reality about the resistance bands is you do have to work around that. It's just the physics of how they work. Right. Um, and when you have, if you're in a gym, um, you know, you have, you've got a cable pulling machine that is made specifically for something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, so resistance bands can be great, um, but you really do have to understand the implement and use it at the right time. Uh, the other time I see people using resistance bands a lot are during squats. So they'll mm -hmm. hold on to the resistance band while the resistance band is under their feet um, and they're holding onto the handles and they're doing a squat. And again, the, the resistance that you're getting from the band is really only at the top. It's actually really when you're standing up, that's when you have the most resistance. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're deep in the squat, you're not getting as much resistance. So just understanding the implement and understanding why you're using it and when you're using it um, mm -hmm. and using it the right way. Um, one of the one of the other great things about a resistance band is we were talking about wrists um, is a great modification is um, because of the way that the handles are, are made, you can actually loop your hand through it and keep your hand open. Uh, and and you can actually have um, it looped so that your the handle is behind you and your mm -hmm. hand can be kind of parallel with the band itself. And now you're just sort of pulling with your hand as opposed to having to grip um, and hold on tightly. So um, so there's a little bit of a modification you can do there. So pros and cons, um, mm -hmm. be aware of it. And again, be aware of how your body is reacting and responding um, to that type of a resistance. Right. Love it. I, I love that modification with the, uh, the open hands. And I oh, try okay. to yeah. teach um, my, my population um, to open their hands as much as possible because also think about it, when you have your hands open, it kind of opens you up. So when you clinch, like you think about baby development and when babies mm -hmm. are first born, we're all clinched up in a little ball. And then as we become more mature, we go through our developmental milestones. We start to have what's called an open synergy pattern um, to mm -hmm. open up. So we, and it, I think it starts a lot with the hands. So if you can have open hands, it helps to open up the chest. It helps open you up, stack your vertebrae. So it, I mean, a lot of that starts with the hands and, um, if for any football or um, sports fans that are out there, you'll see a uh, lot quarterbacks, NFL quarterbacks going through the progressions as they have their hand on the football and the other hand is up here um, to act as a as a counter. And they always teach to have the hand open and again, it's mm -hmm. to open them up. Um, that's just one of the cues I know that we I, when I work with um, throwing coaches, the, some of the mechanics is to have this open like this open pattern. Um, and I try to teach my patients with arthritis as well to try to open things up, open up the chest um, mm -hmm. so then they can breathe better um, and utilize their whole body to, to lift to lift the band. So the, having a TheraBand um, can be helpful. Um, they have TheraBands that with pre-made loops already in them. Um, they're called CLX bands. They're a little bit more expensive, but you can get the rolls, you can buy rolls of them, or you can just loop a regular band uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. Got it. April, I have a question for you just to go back to body weight. So the way that I typically will modify a burpee is I do mine on my fist. I know we were talking about open hands, but, you know, I'm not able to, to do that. But I discovered I could go down like on my knuckles. Is that a bad thing for my wrist? Like, is that too much stress as long as they're supported? I mean, it feels fine. I just want to make sure that I'm not you know, damaging anything down the road because I love, I, the reason why I love burpees is because there was a point where I wasn't able to do it. And so I was like, I'm going to figure it out. And so I figured it out. And once I figured it out, I haven't been able to stop. <laughs> so, so what That's would you say about that as far as my wrist? Like, is that too much stress on it by using my knuckles? 
Well, first of all, Asha, I think props to you for trying something hard and then sticking with it to do it and then learning to love it because you knew you mastered it. And I, yes. I think that really shows determination with somebody with arthritis, especially RA, can have mm -hmm. to master something that is so hard that anybody without any ailments hates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I personally love burpees as well. Um, I'm one of those rare, those rare ducks. And I did them so much, even when I was pregnant with both my kids, that I tore both cartilages in my wrist. So, because I was nine months pregnant doing burpees. Um, so that being said, I think the modification on your fist, that was all I was able to do after I did that to myself. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a great way to be able to participate in weight bearing exercises like planks, mm -hmm. bird dogs, um, burpees, or, um, you know, burpees may be a little intense. You could always go to squat thrust first. Um, right. Burpee is too difficult as a, or rather than doing the jump, um, that's more ballistic in nature. Maybe you do the step in and then pop up. Um, mm -hmm. so there's lots of ways to modify, a, a a squat thrust or a burpee, but right. the best modification for your hands is your fists. And one mm -hmm. of the physicians, the orthopedic surgeons at NYU that I worked with, always would have me come into the room with him when he was seeing patients who were these yoga people. They always had shoulder pain and wrist pain and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so part of my instruction was to teach people modifications when you're doing things on your hands. This is this hyper extension into the wrist when you're weight bearing. Um, is, is really difficult on, mm -hmm. on that joint. Your wrists don't like it, even normal wrists. It's not that great. Um, yeah. So it's better if you can, so if you are doing things on your hands with your hands open, the part of, um, the part of your hand that um, is on the radial side, so this part of your hand, is the part that really should be bearing most of the weight. It takes about 80% of your body weight. So if you are able to go into your hand with your hands flat, you mm -hmm. should try to um, think about pushing through like the base of the index and the middle fingers, um, mm -hmm. because that's gonna be the part of your wrist that is supposed to take a lot of that load, not this side of the wrist. Mm -hmm. um, if that still is something that's bothersome, the next step I would do is, okay, if you could do it on your fist, that might be okay. It might be hard for people who have arthritis of their MP joints, the metacarpal right. joints, which is this big joint back here, they're, mm -hmm. they're prone to arthritis. So therefore, I might give them yoga blocks or push mm -hmm. up, a push-up plus handle, but again, not holding it tight, just kind of resting your hands here with an open, with an open hand and just resting the push-up handle or the yoga block um, to do your exercises. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you're also elevated more of an incline, that can be a little bit easier on the body as another modification too. Right. But doing things on your wrist, if you can tolerate it, is actually better for anyone rather than an open hand and really yeah, pushing yeah. it through. Because okay. I see a lot of people, normal people without any ailments, having issues with their wrists from doing mm -hmm. too much yoga and weight bearing. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to keep on doing burpees. <laughs> so we've got a question from the audience. Best strengthening exercises for wrists and shoulders. So, should, should I'll I double do? down on my rows. <laughs> I'll double down on those seated rows. Um, I, I really will. The uh, if you're in a gym and you're doing a, a seated row, a cable pull, I always like to joke, it's the old fashioned Arnold Schwarzenegger exercise. It's one of the best exercises that you can do. Um, everyone should be doing them. Um, you should be doing them a couple times a week. Uh, but that seated row is a, an absolutely wonderful exercise um, mm -hmm. because it opens opens the chest, strengthens the back. Um, when Whenever you're, uh, if you're seated and the weight is in front of you and you're holding onto it, going to pull you forward if you aren't creating a counterbalance, mm -hmm. right? So or immediately, as soon as you hold on to that, your entire spine, all the muscles of your spine are mm -hmm. now active just by holding on to it. Uh, so it's a it's just a wonderful exercise for posture, which is very important for wrists and shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and we you know we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, you know the neck position is extremely important for wrists and shoulders. So um, so I really do double down on on the seated rows. Um, but the other thing that I think is important is finding exercises where you're um, able to hold on to um, whether it's uh, dumbbells. Um, or, or d different size implements. So your hands become stronger based on your grip. So if you're gripping things that are small, your hands are, are stronger here. 
people who have maybe severe arthritis in their hands can't grip onto something small. So they might need something a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. um, if you're early in a progression of arthritis, you might want to keep challenging your body to try to hold on to those small things. Mm -hmm. So if you take um, dumbbells that have a little bit of a smaller grip, now you're going to be challenging your hands. So that can be um, even with bicep curls or what we call hammer curls, where um, again, the, the neutral wrist and you're, you're just kind of coming through here. So um, your thumb is pointed up from the ceiling if you were to give it a thumbs up. Um, and that hammer curl, that's a little bit of a different position than what a traditional bicep curl would be where your palm might be facing up while you're doing it. So these different positions are gonna strengthen your wrist and your forearm mm -hmm. in a slightly different way. Um, as we were talking about before, the different position of your hands um, while you're doing different exercises mm -hmm. is going to have an impact on your wrist. Your wrist is actually not strong. Your wrist itself is actually very weak. It, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's just tendons that are crossing through here, uh, tendons, other soft tissue and nerves. It's not a, a thick, bulky, muscly area like your hips are. So um, when you're looking at strengthening, you're not really going to be able to strengthen the wrist itself. You're strengthening the forearm and then you're training. Um, we use the word earlier proprioception, but your body's ability to understand how to do things or how to move in space. Mm -hmm. um, you're training that through the way you approach your exercises. So that open hand, as we talked about, as soon as, and if you just sit there and you open your hand and you spread out your fingers as much as you can, you'll feel that the muscles uh, or the tendons on the side of your wrist become taut and they give you a little bit extra stability. Mm -hmm. So um, learning how to get into these different positions. Similarly, if you make a fist, now all of a sudden you have some tautness here. Right. right. So, um, so different positions of your hand while you're exercising can create strength and stability of the wrist that isn't naturally there. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that those are just different different tips to to get a little bit more of upper body strength and stability for those those kind of ailments. Awesome tips. Thank you, Lauren. So before we move into uh, the next topic in maximizing benefits and minimizing pain, let's talk about chair exercises. Lauren, I know that you kind of touched on that as well, but what are um, some good chair workouts that will help um, someone who has limited function and mobility? How can that help them strengthen? themselves. So clearly, you know, we already talked about the squat, you know, standing and sitting. Is there anything else that they can do in the chair to help? If you have a good chair that has arms on it, um, the, this is another way to get a little bit of upper body exercise is by using those arms and, mm -hmm. and using your legs at the same time. So now your legs are helping you up and your arms are helping you up. So that press down onto the arms can give a little bit of an upper body strengthening. It's mm -hmm. really important if you're doing that, that you're not using your shoulders forward, but you're using your back muscles. And I think, again, that's a little counterintuitive. People think they're using their arms, but as you push down into that chair, if you engage your back and push your shoulder blades down, these very big muscles in your back called uh, the latissimus dorsi or the lats mm -hmm. will, will engage and they're huge muscles. They're wonderful muscles to help to your stability and strengthening those by pushing yourself up out of the chair is just another great exercise. Of course, you want a stable chair, no wheels, nothing that rotates. Um, you know, one of those big heavy dining room chairs um, they are the kind of chairs that I'm imagining, but something that you know that you can put your body weight on. It's sturdy. Stay mm -hmm. underneath you. Absolutely. Awesome. I like the chair exercise too, that go, to go back to the wrists and shoulders, you could do everything in one exercise. And I like to work, give um, my clients workouts that incorporate the most bang for their buck. So mm -hmm. one exercise, I'm in the chair right now, you can face the chair, you can tie up one of those bands um, behind a doorknob, make sure that uh, tie it at the end. So you put it in the doorknob, close the door, and then you have the band pulling out this way. So if the band was coming from the door over here, I would have my arms straight out like this. I would make mm -hmm. sure I, I set my shoulder. So now I could just even hold that as my exercise, keeping my wrist in a neutral nice. position. Mm -hmm. Now this is gonna work the outer part of your rotator cuff. So you can work this isometrically. Um, mm -hmm. And same with your wrist, the forearm, the uh, muscles in the back of the wrist, if the band is coming this way. Alternatively, you can turn around. So now the band is going this way. And then now you're working um, the internal rotators of the rotator cuff and the forearm flexors. 
Um, you can hold it isometrically and just hold it for 30 seconds and do three sets, or you can mm -hmm. work up to a minute. When that becomes something that is easy to do, you can either step out so the band is more taut to make it harder, or you can work on then progressing from isometric to isotonic exercise. So you have your arm out here, and if you want to work um, the wrist, you would just turn your wrist in if the, if the band is this way. So now I'm working wrist flexion, or if the band is this way, I'm working wrist extension. Um, you can also work on articulating um, the joints and the wrist, the little carpal bones by doing little circles within a pain-free motion. Um, now the shoulder is working as a stabilizer um, while you're working this uh, distal extremity as a, what's called a phasic mover. You'll feel this a ton in your core and you can do this in a seated position in a chair. It's very safe. Then if you can, you can be in a standing position. So now you're working in the upper body or the lower body as well. You can even get in a squat position and hover your, your tushy right above your chair. So now you're in a squat. This is very advanced. Um, and you can be doing the same exercise. So now you're doing lower body, you're doing shoulder, you're setting your back, you're doing all the periscapular muscles underneath the scapula while you're mm -hmm. working the forearm and your grip. And again, you can hold on to the band or you can have an open hand depending on, on what feels more, most comfortable for you. So that's a great exercise to get all of these different things with the most bang for your buck with mm -hmm. regressions and progressions as the person sees fit. Love it. Awesome. All right, and one more thing while we're talking about safety and modification. So what are some tips for preventing injury during a workout? Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, you know, warming up, you know, before stretching afterwards, um, you know, cooling down. Uh, what would you all have to, to add about that to prevent injury? I, think I would with, oh, go ahead. Lauren. No, please, no, please, Jessica, go ahead. I would say with preventing energy, um, injury is trying not to do too much in one shot. So being mindful of what you did last time in weight before you increase it too much and can't mm -hmm. do it. And also, um, as we talked about modifications, if bending over to pick things up off the floor is something that's difficult for you to do, make sure the tools that you need to complete your workout are at a level that they're easy for you to get to. to get so to. maybe putting them on a countertop or on a coffee table or on the couch by you, having everything you need in your little zone so that you can be effective in the use of your time and do the things properly without causing any unnecessary strain to other areas of your body. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Jessica. All right, so let's talk about um, how to maximize the benefits of strength training workouts while minimizing pain and soreness. So what are some do's and don'ts before and after working out to maximize benefits and reduce pain? Um, so for, for my clientele, uh, my population, I tell them I can have a dynamic warm up beforehand, mm -hmm. um, maybe heat up their joints beforehand, whatever that might be. So typically, I think a dynamic warm up where you're going through um, range of motion exercises, especially if you are very stiff, this mm -hmm. can help warm up the body, help heat up your core, um, increase your heart heart rate so then now it's pumping blood into the extremities to warm everything up um so then you can go through your exercises a little bit more safely mm -hmm. um so dynamic warm-ups um can be really really helpful and also i like to do these types of stretching um prior because then you get that joint mobile you push lubrication into the joint so the mm -hmm. joint can move a little bit better um, maybe I have the client take a super hot shower before they come in and do their exercises just to get things warmed up. So water as therapy is very, very effective. Um, mm -hmm. And they could do things, uh, what we call closed chained exercises in the shower. So if they have shoulder stiffness, um, they can't get their shoulders up. I say just take a wet washcloth while you're in the hot shower with the water as hot as you can stand it on your shoulders, you know, move up the wall um, in your shower. Mm -hmm. um, you can do this in a seated position if you feel like you're a little bit unstable. So if you have a shower chair, that can help with safety. Um, but then moving your arms up the shower wall. So you use the wall as leverage. So mm -hmm. then it becomes closed chain. So you can move your arm up into that motion and then come back down and think about using your core and your abs as you pull your arms down. Actually, uh, any kind of straight arm um, 
uh, lowering is a great, very high EMG or muscle activation for the rectus abdominis. Mm -hmm. um, so doing things of that nature and any kind of warm up prior to starting exercises, I think going to be a really good bet for people to keep them or even just to start their day um, mm -hmm. before they get going and, and moving. Right. Awesome. Thank you, April. I think so. Um, yeah, go ahead. To that yeah. is just to remember, you know, some of the basic nutrition things that we know and hydration things is make sure that you are fueling your body for what you're going to be doing, mm -hmm. like getting up first thing in the morning and like maybe not having had any fluids like water. You maybe drink some water before. Make sure you have water for during your routine, right? Because you don't want to wait till you're thirsty to drink because oftentimes if we're thirsty, we might not be hydrated, which is not good for our tissue right. in itself. And then, you know, understanding when we should eat certain things. And obviously I'm not a nutritionist or a registered dietitian, but making sure that you're understanding what you're putting in your body. So eating four slices of pizza before you work out is probably not the right fuel or the recovery that you want to eat afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding, you know, good, healthy options to give you some fuel before and then quick recovery after, especially if it's in the morning or in the evening. Uh, you don't want to have a big meal after you work out because you've just done really good, but maybe what's a, a good snack that might have some beneficial protein for afterwards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Jessica, I think that's such a great point. I think nutrition is really, um, it's not talked about enough in terms of recovery and mm -hmm. fueling for your, for your body. Um, we also know that, um, you know, a lot of our immunity and, um, and how we feel lives in our gut, right? We know, we know this through an abundance of research. So what we fuel our body with can really control inflammation in our body um, mm -hmm. and can provoke um, increased exacerbation of arthritis. It's well documented. Um, I saw, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, he's a physical therapist and a, cl a clinical nutritionist. And he spoke, uh, Joe Tata, he spoke at a conference um, that I spoke at a couple of years ago and it was like mind blowing of, um, he was talking about chronic pain and, and how you can just change your diet a little bit by keeping a food diary for one day and mm -hmm. then just maybe removing one thing that might be inflammatory, like alcohol or mm -hmm. red meat or, you know, any, any things of those natures and replacing it with something that we know might be really good for you. Um, right. And just doing it one step at a time. And then the next week you take out another thing. So it's not huge, drastic changes, um, but you're making these tiny little changes to help guide and nutrition because it's such an understated piece. We want to go to the quick fix, which is medication. How can I get rid of my pain right now? Um, but all of this, these things are long lasting and proven, take time and aren't mm -hmm. always the most pleasant. Um, I would rather have four slices of pizza before I work out, but I know I shouldn't. So maybe <laughs> I should have some sort of protein. And if you don't eat meat, then there's plenty of options as a vegan or a vegetarian in terms of legumes and ways to fuel your body that way. And especially after exercise, having ample amounts of protein to build, to uh, give your body um, the nutrients to build collagen, to build mm -hmm. muscle, to help build bone. And we know that the more muscle you have, the more bone density you will have because the mm -hmm. bone has to build and adapt to the muscle around it. And that mm -hmm. could be really helpful for people who suffer from osteopenia or osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. I remember a registered dietitian and exercise physiologist that I have the pleasure of working with at HSS. Has, there are two things that always stuck out to me is make your plates colorful, mm -hmm. right? So different colors have different nutrients. So don't be boring and always have the same thing on your plate. Um, color is good. And then two is like one of the best recovery drinks to have afterwards, if provided you're not lactose intolerant, is like a chocolate milk. So chocolate Lauren, milk. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, your thoughts on those too. Yeah, chocolate milk. So I was, um, I recently was certified in something called blood flow restriction therapy. I know you guys have it at HSS and they have a whole segment on nutrition. And that was one of their big things was chocolate milk and having enough milk because that contains leucine, which is a really important um, amino acid mm -hmm. that I don't know that we get enough of. And it's part, it's something that helps to stimulate what's called IGF-1, which helps, it's, it's a chemical in your brain that your pituitary gland releases um, to help build collagen um, which can then help build muscle and bone, and et cetera. So 
that was something that they talked about is just have the chocolate milk, the moo milk or something like that. <laughs> um, so very, yeah, that's, that's excellent advice. And I love chocolate milk, so. Yes, awesome. All right, well, let's move to uh, workout plans and timing. So we're gonna discuss how to structure an ideal routine of strength routine for arthritis. So ideally, how many days a week should someone practice strength and resistance training for better joint health and for how long? I think it's really important to remember, um, and you know, April said this word a couple of times, recovery is essential. Mm -hmm. And um, the when you're doing strength training exercises, your muscles need 48 hours after the exercise to fully recover before you do the exercise again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's an essential, and that's a that's the basic. That's just the baseline. Um, but for some people, it might be longer. Um, and you know, as we age, our bodies change. So something that maybe worked for me in my 20s doesn't work for me anymore as I'm nearing 50. So those are the things that uh, you know we need to be aware of. Is is as our body um, is what we're doing with exercise is we're taxing our body. We're putting a stress on our body, and after yeah. that, we need the time to recover. So. Um, so again, the it depends answer, but yeah. uh, what I would say is at least um, 48 hours before you're doing the same exercises. So if you're doing a lower body routine on a Monday, you're not gonna do that same lower body routine again until Wednesday, mm -hmm. but maybe on Tuesday, you could do an upper body routine. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a nice way to break up your exercise, um, especially for people who are just starting out. You don't have to do a 45 minute or an hour long exercise program six days a week um, to see results. It could just be five or 10 minutes um, every single day, but just make sure that you're giving your body that 48 hours to recover before you're taxing those same muscles again. That makes sense, perfect. So Jessica, what are your thoughts on aquatic strength training and um, you know the benefits and everything? Talk to us about that. It's actually one of my favorite things to do. So I love treating in the pool. Not that I necessarily go in with the patient, but I instruct from on the deck. Um, and I find the beauty that I have, we have a laminar flow pool, which means I have resistance in the water that I can increase or decrease for certain activities. So I can work on balance and strength training um, mm -hmm. and also mobility. I find the water to be a very friendly environment. So I'm not putting somebody in an ice bath. I'm putting somebody in the proper temperature water, which is anywhere from like 88 to 92 degrees to do exercise because you have people that may be higher level in their exercise. Think about, you know, athletes that can do more and jumps and stuff in the water. I can't have their heart rate go up too high and I don't want to risk them passing out. Mm -hmm. And then I want others that might have a lot of, you know, irritation to their joints and need freedom to move. So you have the great benefits of the cohesiveness of water, which helps provide resistance. You have the laminar flow, which gives resistance, or you can create your own turbulence and movement of water around you that mm -hmm. gives you resistance, as well as it also gives you buoyancy. So assistance in range of motion. So it's all in how you use your body movements that you're mm -hmm. also always getting resistance in one way or the other in your movement. Right. What I will caution patients to do is not to overdo in the water because you feel like you can do anything and you can do it forever. But once you come out of the pool, gravity now is not your friend again and it starts to pull on you. So I say you have to get your land legs back after you've been using your sea legs and kind mm -hmm. of work that way. And understanding that after exercising the water, similar to exercise on land, you're gonna get soreness, but your soreness may, may be later delayed. So I'll always say when they're first time in the pool with me, I say, I'm gonna take it a little bit lighter today. You're gonna to tell me how you felt when I see you the next time, which will guide me if, can I ramp things up or do I need to tone things down? Mm -hmm. Seeing how you can tolerate that. Thank you so much, perfect. So, um, so let's go back to timing. So what does a perfect week of strength training look like? Um, you know, how many days should be dedicated to full body versus upper body? And honestly, you kind of really already answered this um, 
Laura, but I'm not sure if there's anything else else to add, but I think you pretty much answered that one. Yeah, I would just say and any exercise is the perfect week. Um, mm -hmm. Any time that you've um, that something is better than nothing. 10% mm -hmm. is better than zero. Uh, and I think it's really important that people give themselves that grace, especially uh, when pain is a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, that, okay, if I can only do 10 minutes of something today, but that'll be better than me doing no exercise at all. And yes. I think that's that tends to be sort of where that motivation hump comes in is how, how do I get over this motivation hump? I'm, I'm hurting right now and I don't, I don't want to do this. I, mm -hmm. I just don't want to because it hurts right now. So what is, wh what are 10 minutes of something that I can do that? What are the exercises that feel the best to me that I feel the best after words? Um, so I know I'm going to feel better when I'm done than I do now. And let me just do those. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the perfect week of exercises when you sort of overcome your own uh, your own barriers uh, and and make exercise your friend. Awesome, thank you. So we're getting ready to wrap up. However, um, April, you have a patient, so I want you to go ahead and, and take care of that patient. Thank you so much you for much. for joining us. Yes, yes, we appreciate your expertise and everything. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. All right, so we're going to go ahead and and continue. So, um, so what about the timing of day? And I would say that would probably, you know, depend upon the patient too, because I know most of us, um, you know, we're pretty stiff in the morning. So, you know, I tend to. I know that I definitely have to warm up really good first if I'm working out in the morning. So, you know, I think it just really depends upon the person, but would you say there's a perfect time of day? There's really, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say. I don't perfect, think but. there's ever a perfect time of day to do many things, but still. right. Um, so <laughs> I think it's like, what works best for you? What time increments works best for you? Because if you're saying you're going to do it every day at three o'clock and that's a crazy time for you, you're not mm -hmm. going to stick to it. Um, you want the exercise to be a motivating part of your day. You want it to help you at your time where you need that little pick me up. If sometimes the morning might be the best and helps you get a kickstart to your day once you get loose. And mm -hmm. maybe you sometimes get on a, a stationary bike to just get the joints moving. No resistance, just get flow going. Right. Um, or maybe you're more of a midday workout person, like you're working from home, you have your lunch break, you're going to take 25 minutes of your lunch break to do some exercise because that fits your life the best and it's not interrupted. Then mm -hmm. take those 25s and maximize what you can do in those 25 minutes. Um, I think I learned a lot during the pandemic because of how we had to restructure how we see patients. Everything. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot that can get done in 30 minutes and you can feel really successful in 30 minutes, whether you're recovering from surgery, learning how to move for the first time or exercising. It's just about that efficiency plan that you put forward and sticking to it. And I'll tell my patients, don't try to bite off more than you can chew because mm -hmm. then you're gonna fall backwards or maybe stop doing what is really good and needed for your body. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So as we wrap up, let's talk about motivation. Um, I tell my clients all the time, you know, you're not always going to be motivated. Motivation wears off, but it's that discipline and practicing those healthy habits that's going to keep you going every time because motivation, you know, it comes and goes. <laughs> so what are some best, what, what are the best ways to stay motivated when you're having a bad day with arthritis? Um, yeah. What would you say? I think it's having a reason. Um, mm -hmm. I think really tapping into your reason why. why? What is Absolutely. what is it that I'm getting out of this every day? Why have I decided that an exercise routine is right for me? Mm -hmm. What are the long term benefits of what I'm doing? Um, and you know, exercise. I think one of the things I love about it is it's about showing up. Mm -hmm. it's about, it's about doing it. It's about doing the work. Um, and even if you're doing a little less, you know, I'll, I'll even just say for myself, I went to the gym yesterday and I was on the elliptical and 25 minutes in, I said, 
I'm done. I'm off. I'm getting off. I just was done. I was tired. And instead of going and doing the weight training that I had planned, I went over and I stretched and then I went home. Mm-hmm. And that's okay because I showed yeah. up at the gym yesterday. Exactly. And, exactly. and that's really what it's about. It's about showing up on a regular basis. So, you know, what are the things that you need to remind yourself each day when it's a hard day? It's why am I doing this? Um, mm-hmm. Different motivators for different people. A lot of my clients have said, you know, I want, I want to be able to get on the floor with my grandkids. I want to be able to play with my grandkids. Um, I want to be able to hike. I had a, a client who wanted to be able to hike out into the wilderness so she could take pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there are, what, what's that thing that you're striving for? And then when you're having a bad day, whether you've got it written on a post-it or a note card or, you know, mm-hmm. just a mantra in your head, whatever it is, just remember what that is and, and go and, and show up and just do something that day. Absolutely. And, you know, Laura, that's exactly what I tell my clients. Like when I do a health assessment before, you know, we get into anything else, I have them to write down five reasons why their health and uh, wellness journey is important to them. Um, And I tell them, I'm like, you know, you're going to have to refer back to this on the days that you don't feel like it, you know? And I tell them, I'm like, you know, put it in a place where you can look at it every day, where you can see it every day. And and I personally have different post-it notes and things up that I can see that reminds me why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's, typically what jump starts me, you know, every time when I don't have that motivation, you know, all on my own. And I honestly feel like mindset is everything too. you know, um, practicing positive affirmations. And even when you you're not feeling so strong, you know, tell yourself, you know, I am strong, you know, I am capable, I can do this, I am enough. And so, you know, I feel like that really plays a role in, you know, your delivery and performance and showing up for yourself. And I use that term too, Laura, like, you know, you've got to show up for yourself. If you don't show up for yourself, who will? Who will? So you've got to dig deep and just, um, and just, yeah, and just know that you're, you're worth it. You're worth it. So... Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to wrap up. So is there anything else, any lasting thoughts anyone wants to add before I wrap it up? We've I'll been just say, strong. sometimes just change your scenery. Yeah. You know, don't go to the same room every time. When it's a beautiful mm-hmm. day, go outside because yes. that will help perk you up too. Mm-hmm. Um, so just change your space a little bit. Don't get caught up in the same thing. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, remember, with any, like, diet or, fa- like, new fad that you do, remember you're allowed a little bit of a cheat day every now and again. Yes. So if you want to decrease it or take a day off to recover, that's okay. But you're not mm-hmm. jumping off the train because the train's keeping going mm-hmm. and you got to keep that train moving forward. Yes, exactly. And I like to call it a treat meal, not a cheat yes. meal. Like treat ah, meal. You I like know? it. <laughs> That's right. And another thing I always say, too, is, you know, what you eat, you're either feeding your disease or you're fighting it. You know, so knowing that difference between, you know, the inflammatory foods and the anti-inflammatory foods. And, you know, that's just it, it, it really plays a huge role. It really does. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today. So I'd like to thank our guest again for such an enlightening discussion and for lending their time and expertise tonight. So thank you all so much. And thank you to ACE, the American Council on Exercise and APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association for helping make this event possible. Also thanks to our viewers for joining us tonight. So take care and we're signing off. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.